I have no idea what it is you see. Let's see. I, I was born making trouble. Not just gender trouble, but all kinds of trouble. Conceived in Kansas City, but born in California. In year of the fire rooster. Some call that year of the cock, and that's true too. I have been known to like a bit of a cock a doodle do. And we are in year, today, tomorrow is year of the fire rooster. I'm having my fire cock return. You get that once in your life when you're 60. Anyway, I come from a long line of waitresses and Avon ladies. Ding dong. A side step away from what some call poor white trash and what I call the working, working class. I call myself off-white in order to give whiteness a hue and show precisely where it's placed on the color wheel of fortune. I call myself off-white in order to honor my Native American, Black Irish, and African great-grandmothers. And my mother. But I was always a spunky girl. The first time the cops brought me home, I was five years old. Picked up with my best friend Leah Lathry for selling red rocks from Mars to the unsuspecting local human population. I persuaded the cops to let us keep the magic. Oh no, we were trying to finance our deep space intergalactic mission. We were trying to go home. At 10, I staged a protest in front of the Santa Maria Times because they refused to hire me to be a newspaper boy. Because in 1967, apparently you needed a penis to deliver newspapers. <laughs> At 11, I wrote a letter asking, inquiring about becoming a Rhodes Scholar and told, were told that women were not eligible, but keep on getting those A's and B's. At 17, I was arrested for obscenity at a nude beach on Santa Barbara, California. What was my crime? I refused to put my top on unless they told every man and boy on that beach to do the same thing. And in court, I gave an impassioned speech, which they found amusing. And they fined me half the usual penalty. Needless to say, it was a fine I would never pay. I knew for certain that I was right and they were wrong. And I understood from a young age that the world is a hostile place especially for those of us assigned female at birth. And I would say, or become female. And I knew it was up to me to say so. Silence, never an option I've been able to exercise. So, thank you, Alex. or too feminine, and definitely not too sexy, because the cardinal lesbian sin was if a man got excited about you. That was something that was totally forbidden. It was seized by U.S. Customs, pages were cut out in Canada, and I got a lot of attention for it, which was pretty good. Um, this was my first lesbian lover. Um, and this is an example of um, permissible lesbian imagery, along with this one, because you know we are, we're supposed to have sex simultaneously with no penetration. <laughs> um, but what's uh, ironic about, about this image was that it was 
these two women, um, friends of mine, and this woman here was the first, the first um, lesbian who introduced me to um, BDSM and lesbian sex culture. Um, I was going to art school at the time at the San Francisco Art Institute, and I found this bar, Scott's Bar, where I started making photographs of the hot butches and super femmes that were part of um, the people who went there, the stripper girlfriends. And this was a series of photographs um, called Scott's Bar. It was Charmaine, the one in, wearing my leather jacket here, who introduced me to um, sexual pleasure, you could say. She was the first woman I ever had an orgasm with, which turned me immediately into a lesbian. I've been having sex with women for five years, I never had an orgasm. I could have orgasms with men, but women. So I, I owe Charmaine a great deal. <clears throat> and Pat Califia published the first photograph. Does anyone here know who Pat Califia is? No, yeah. Pat Califia? Yeah. Um, so this was a um, photograph of me when I was living in Janice Joplin's former lesbian lover's studio the Jewish lesbian lover in the Goodman building, and this was me when I landed in London. And I started, which was in 82, when I first came to London, and I started making, I continued making photographs of lesbian sex culture and um, punk dykes, etc. When I came back in 1987 for good to live there, um, I got involved with a group called Chain Reaction, which was the Lesbian Sex and Performance Club. And these are some pictures, and these are all, lots of them are in Love Bites. 19, what is it? 88. <clears throat> Back in the days when I was called Della Disgrace. So Della Grace Volcano used to be Della Disgrace, Della Grace. Um, Debbie Wood, if she could, um, lots of names. I was even Mrs. Beasley once because I had to get married to stay in the country. Long story, we don't have time for that. And I got rid of Mrs. Beasley because by marrying Johnny Volcano. And now I have two kids and we are the only volcanoes in Sweden. Anyway, I, I digress. So, this is um, one of my better known photographs that was taken in 1988 as well. Believe it, this is a very sweet photograph, right? Almost nothing you can, but when I was curating an exhibition called The Lesbian Gaze in London, um, five photographers, five lesbians pulled out because this was too disturbing an SM image for them to associate themselves with me. That's how intense it was at the time. This image of Robin, and I'm showing you a few of like the poignant images from my 35 year career as a career, um, as, a, as a queer photographer, that kind of are important to me. Robin, um, was on the cover of a queer magazine called Rouge. They printed posters um, that went up in all the gay male bars in London. And then there was some question as to what the true sex of Robin actually was. The next issue, it was discovered that Robin was actually a lesbian, a woman. And those posters came down super quick. And that was the first time I understood that sexual identity for some people was very precarious, was unstable, was something that was not um, perhaps safe because so many gay men were upset that they had found a woman attractive. So this started a whole series of photographs where I unconsciously, not consciously, but I, I continue to reproduce that idea of like 
disturbing the idea of the, the solidity of sexual attraction and sexual orientation identities. Um, if you want to see more, there's a lot more upstairs. The next book I did um, was, I guess, 1999, no. Yeah, 1999, look, the Drag King came, book came out, and it was with the, it didn't change. Has it changed? No. The Drag King book, which I did with the academic uh, Jack Halberstam here, who was, did anybody hear the Spicago radio address last night? Did anybody of you hear that? Okay, nobody else. You were there. Okay. You didn't tune in. Never mind. It was great. Um, Nina Rappi, who is a, a Greek queer who lives here now back in Athens, she was a judge at this drag king contest along with Josh Albertson, which I totally lost. I lost because I was too feminine and I was not reproducing a traditional form of masculinity in a way that Dredd, who for a time was the m most famous drag king in the world, also did, destabilizing the notions of the, the true body. So here's a few pictures of, this is Tejal and Natasha, who I met when I was doing a drag king workshop in Zagreb. And I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of the box, because I hear a lot of people say about their identity, I don't want to be boxed in. Don't put me in a box. But just to think a little bit more deeply about the box, we can also say that the box protects us. We live in boxes. We're in a box right now. Boxes keep us warm and safe and dry. And we move between boxes. So that is... Um, Another way of thinking about the box. Kings du Berry are, is a drag king group in France that I met, which was, and this is the disposable boy toys in Santa Barbara. And then Sweden, we are kunga, means in Swedish, we are kings. And I thought I was participating in a drag king workshop with um, a drag king who later became my lover. Um, Luigi Cabron de la Concha. And the Arcunger is, it's interesting how our queer images and images around race get commodified. Here they're using two boys of color to sell a mobile phone. So I thought it would be interesting to juxtapose, to put these two together. Um, the next book I did which came out in 2000 was Sublime Mutations, which is about the mutations that are written on the body through loss, longing, accident, design, disease. Bodies as sites of mutation. I'm wondering, oh, here, I'm sorry, I'm not doing anything. Are you guys with me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So here's another image. Um, this is Zach and Lola Flash. And here is an image that also performs that kind of um, labor of disturbing the boundaries, disturbing the solidity, solidity. If you didn't know my work and you didn't know these images, most people, and I've tested this, would assume that this is a man, and this is not just a man, but it looks a little gay. Does it not? <laughs> yeah. But, again, it is, it's um, Jackie, who's a good friend of mine and a firefighter in London. We're gonna, this was made, what, I don't know what year, 1992? How long ago was that? A long time ago. We're going to, and Jackie is still a firefighter, 20 years or more, almost 20 years older. 
So um, we're going to be taking more pictures soon. And Lesbian Cock is, um, it was pre-Drag King, before we even thought about Drag King stuff. Um, I was doing, we were performing. Chain Reaction was a lesbian sex club, but it was also, our motto was permission to play. And it was a safe space for trans women at a time when no other kinds of feminists or women were allowing trans women into the space. And it was also a place where women could be sexy, because even in the late 80s and the early 90s, women were not, queer women especially, were not allowed, no, only queer women, hetero women could be sexy. Queer women, lesbian women, bi women, you could not be sexy because you would then be betraying the, the cause somehow. So these are, this was another image that psychoanalysis analysis wrote about the three graces. Um, an early trans photograph I did of a young trans guy um, in Berlin, David. And the next book, I'm going to go a little more quickly through this. Stems of Power was with the Swedish academic Ulrika Dahl. And Dyke Marilyn talks about her black roots. So the, this was my most recent book, actually. So it's looking at um, Pratiba writes about being a pocket-sized Venus. Pratiba with Alice Walker and doing like amazing documentaries and movies. She's a filmmaker. I was also very interested in images of femininity that were very much um, enmeshed with masculinity. This is the bearded lady, um, Jennifer Miller. And here is um, Amelia and her lover, his name I forgot, I'm afraid, who worked as, as the Diamond Daggers. <clears throat> and she was a bearded fem. And then we have another Elise and... Elise and Krista, who, are, who perform as both the fat lady and the bearded lady. So I'm looking at all different kinds of resistant forms of femininity. And what inspired this book is that the Drag King book is my only book that went into a second printing. Got a lot of recognition. They had my photographs on Sex in the City. It was written about in the mainstream press in Britain, at least. And it was um, got a lot of attention, as masculinity tends to. Femininity, on the other hand, when I met up with, when I met Ulrika Dahl, who's the one in the middle here, with Kate Bornstein and her lover Barbara Corellis, she was like, what about the femmes? And once again, even in queer dyke culture, in lesbian culture, feminine women were being um, kind of in a secondary position. They were not, they were not being seen. Maybe, I don't know how it is in Greece, but in the UK, in, in London, in the USA, if a feminine lesbian went to a queer club, they would say, are you sure you're in the right place? Does anybody have that? that? Yeah, okay. you hear me, you know what I'm saying. Okay, now for a little bit more spoken word. This is a Google translation, I just, I did it for y'all. Bodies. That queer. <laughs> Bodies that queer. This is um, one of my alter egos, Delton John. <laughs> so making work about the queer body is, is kind of like mission impossible. I really should know better than to talk about the queer body as if such a thing actually exists, even if the body I make the most use of belongs to me. Um, because queer is actually not a noun, but a verb in drag. 
passing as an adjective. Okay, never mind. <laughs> the queer body is a body that is always in transition. Transmogrification, rather than conversion, according to Jay Prosser. A monstrous and sublime mutation, according to me. Queer bodies are bodies that don't matter. Bodies that are disposable and often disowned. Bodies that are not valued or valuable. Bodies that through the simple act of existence come to personify resistance. Queer bodies are vulgar bodies, plebeian bodies, street bodies. Bodies that don't know the meaning of discipline. Bodies that reject the adage one can never be too thin or too rich. Queer bodies create the template for cultural disgust and teach us what we must not want to be or to have. If bodies are sites of anything, then queer bodies are sites where the resistance is most fertile. Queer bodies are bodies that refuse regulation and resist commodification, and at the same time, make spectacles of ourselves. Queer bodies are bodies that are not pampered or pilate, bodies that seldom swim in public and feel forced to choose passing over personal comfort. Bodies that are confined to spaces where access is available. And access needs to mean a lot more than a ramp and a handicapped toilet. Consider trans bodies. <coughs> Clothed, I am a man. Naked, I am a question says Laszlo Perlman, a performance artist who employs his own naked, hyper-masculine body as an antidote to the obligatory gender dysphoria most trans people are required to perform if they want to access technologies of gender that might make their lives more livable. Consider Racialized bodies. Consider Castor Semenya, a runner with a body that if a white woman possessed it, would have been celebrated rather than offered as a sacrifice on the altar of normalcy. Consider disabled bodies. Consider Bob Flanagan's super masochist. His body refused to renounce pleasure or to behave as a sick person should. A body with orifices that leaked and demanded to be filled. A body with wounds that opened and would not close, reminding us painfully of our own. Consider intersex bodies. Consider my body. A body that has chosen to amplify rather than erase its intersexiness. A body that is unwilling to conform to claustrophobic cultural definitions of female or male. A body that puts itself on the line to be judged by you. Consider the fact continues to have the power 
to regulate and reform our intersex bodies, to cut away our ability to experience genital pleasure or to reproduce ourselves in all our ambiguous glory. So what, what does the queer body do? It performs objection with the kind of power that only those of us who are despised can acquire. It shows us how to love all that we're taught to hate. Through this act of repudiation, this act of affirmation, the queer body screams, look at me, love me, if you dare. I'm going to talk about intersex now. Um, this was a billboard. I didn't make this picture of me. It was made in Sao Paulo, Brazil, sometime, a long time ago. Uh, and it says, I am, I, I've called myself a gender terrorist in the past. It says, I am a bomb in the boys' club. Tick tock, tick tock. So intersex is an umbrella term used for people who are born with or who develop, as I did at puberty, um, characteristics that are, are mixed. A reproductive or sexual um, body trait that don't fit standard definitions of female or male. But the most important feature of all intersex variations is that they do not conform to socially sanctioned definitions of sex and gender. Now, in Greek mythology, which most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with, right? Um, Hermaphroditus was the child of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Homer informs us that the water nymph, Salmansis, I don't know how to pronounce it, fell in love with Hermaphroditus and prayed to be united with him forever. In her answer to a prayer, the god gods merge the two bodies into one. Um, so the, the history of the hermaphrodite started in Greece, and many of you will have read Middlesex, perhaps? Middlesex? Jeffrey Jennings? Um, factually, lots of errors, but still a good book. Um, so we know that, we know from history that sometimes children whose bodies were mixed, were left to, to die, and this is still the case sometimes in some places and in recent um, contemporary Western culture too. But there was a time when hermaphrodites, especially in the late 19th century, they presented themselves, especially in France and the UK, to be objects of study. Um, specimens, medical specimens, and that was the way they got paid for it, and they had relatively high status, and this was one of the most famous of the French hermaphrodites, um, Madeleine, Le, Marie Madeleine Lefort, Lefort, born in 1799 and died 1864. And this is a high status image because of the way you can see that she is, they are are depicted. Um, Herculin Barben was a famous French hermaphrodite um, immortalized in Memoirs of a Hermaphrodite. Is that what it's called? Yes, Memoirs of a Hermaphrodite. And this is an intersex person in the UK who, um, who made a, ex, um, a one woman show about it, um, Sarah Lieber. But in the, in the memoir that Michel Foucault discovered, um, it's a very interesting story, and, and she was forced to become a man and committed suicide, but left these memoirs. And she even predicted that medicine, the medical establishment, would make a spectacle of her body and 
draw her, so she even, there's even existing drawings of her genitals. Um, she says, oh, maybe I don't have it here, what will become of me? Okay. There were also in the Olympics, we've learned a lot um, about the instability, how sex, not just gender, how we feel about our, ourselves as male or female or something else, but also sex is a sexual, uh, is a social construction. And many people discovered through testing, um, chromosome testing or hormone testing, that they were not quite female enough to fight, um, to compete in the, elect, the Olympics. And the most recent case, of course, is Castor Semenya. Um, there's many, many, many examples that I'm not going to go into here. Eric, um, no, here we go. There is another one. Eric Schneeger, um, a Viennese um, Aust uh, Austrian skier, only discovered that he was intersex um, through being tested. And they, they used to have to do horrific things. Women athletes would have to parade in front of a panel of judges, naked, to prove they were female enough before chromosome testing. Um, so some people who are intersex reject the, the sex they were assigned at birth and transition. Which you could say, I, I never went from female to male. I went from female, being perceived as female, to intersex even though I'm still perceived as a guy. We'll get into that. Here is um, Nadar Gaspar Felix Trichenon, who was a French photographer 1820 to 1910. He went under the name of Nadar. He's considered um, one of the fathers of photography. And he made these images of a French hermaphrodite um, in 1868. They weren't supposed to be published until his death, and they weren't. Um, but this is a common image of how there, I've, I've done a lot of research in medical libraries, and this is very much how the medical photographs are made. This is the important part. The, the man, the doctor who discovers the genitals that are not considered um, proper genitals. And you can see the shame on the face, on, in the expression of the person being photographed. His name we don't know. This is a kind of a intersex person made this slide. Um, it's called a phallometer. And if your clitoris or your phallus is in this range, between one and two and a half centimeters, it's unacceptable, and you are clitorectomized. Female or intersex genital mutilation. You think that's a thing of the past? It's still happening. Only this time they say it's better surgeries. And this happened to my cousin Heidi. And this is what motivated these photographs which I did photograph portraits of trans men. Um, the picture with the, the black phallus was uh, my friend Zachary Natas, and he was the first trans man. He came to me to photograph his transition, and this was his idea to make a joke. It's kind of in conversation with Robert Maplebrook, you know, the, the myth of the larger black penis. So is that a one inch? or a two-inch phallus, or a two-foot phallus. And then this, uh, this is my genitals, actually. Um, no shame here. But it's also making a joke about white masculinity, because white men never think their penis is big enough. Not in Greece, huh? Okay, you don't think that. <laughs> As um, I'm going to quote, this is, this is a photograph of a trans man, even though it's called Herm Torso. And I'm talking about the truth of the trans body, is that it is not an intersex body, but it is mixed. It is hermaphroditic. When you have your clothes off, you cannot pass 
as either a male or a female. So as Foucault says, do we truly need a true sex with a persistence that borders on stubbornness? Modern Western society has answered in the affirmative. They have obstinately brought into play this question of a true sex in an order of things where one might have imagined that all that counted was the reality of the body and the intensity of its pleasures. And this is what has motivated, it took me 20 years, and from 19, well I don't know, I can't do the math. From 1995 to 2011, I've been looking for intersex people to be, who were willing to be visibly intersex. Do you recognize where this is taken? Do you recognize this as being in Athens last year? We had an intersex forum. So these are all intersex activists from around the world. Last year we came to Athens to do some political work. But it started in Brussels. I'm just going to go through these quite quickly. And went on to Stockholm. And this is our year, our, mostly our European and African and American boy group organization, Intersex International. You'll recognize this group here. Um, in Stockholm, we're getting bigger and bigger every year. And then here this was um, in Riga, just the European members. So I'm just going to go through this um, and you can read the names here. But the, I, there's more than 60 different forms of intersex variation that we know of. As many as one in a hundred, some people say, but 2% of the human population has some form, some variation of intersex. Bodies that do not completely conform either hormonally, chromosomally, genitally, or um, physically. So intersex is about biological characteristics, physical traits of the body. Trans is more about gender and how one feels about themselves. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to discuss, or if you have any disagreements, too. So we'll go on. Intersex people are all over the world, in every culture, in every class. There are some places where the gene pool is not so big, where there are larger populations, such as the Gaza Strip and the Dominican Republic are two places that I know of. This is Enns, who's um, in a lot of exhibitions with me. He's also an artist, um, an intersex artist. There is a Maddie produced a film called Intersections. Have, have some of you seen that? It's pretty amazing. Deborah has passed away. She died last year. Hiker is doing amazing work in um, all over China, not just in Taiwan, through giving free hugs for intersex. Sally Gross was doing a lot of work in South Africa, and she died without proper health care and um, alone and in a pretty horrible way in South Africa. Dan is, is our our kind of our leader who does all the legislative and administrative stuff. Poland, Bulgaria, Belgium, Austria. Kitty is amazing. Kitty's come on board in the last few years. And Kitty, we can talk about this if you want to later, but Kitty is her variation is called androgen in sense insensitivity syndrome. It's when you're born with a body that has XY chromosomes, but your body lacks the receptor to um, to use the testosterone your body produces. And, and the way that medical 
establishing a tree thought would be to remove the internal testes, saying perhaps it would be cancerous, where in fact that's not proven at all, um, but it hooks you on hormones for the rest of your life. Leslie in the UK, Maella in France, Miriam in Copenhagen in the Netherlands, Dawn in the UK, and Dawn and Kitty and some women, it's, there's a form of cis normativity, heteronormativity, that the face of intersex in the mainstream, which is great. Has anyone heard about the, the Belgian model who's in Vogue, who's in, come out as intersex? Fantastic, I love it. But there are many, you know, what the people who get elevated and who are visible in the mainstream media are those who can comply with and fit into conventional norms of femininity. Young, usually white, beautiful, tall, thin supermodels. And as you can see, all of us are intersex. Hida, actually, I should say. Is anyone familiar with the film called um, Gender Knots by Monica Choit? It's a, it's a really old film. It's mostly about trans men, but when I saw Hida talking about being intersex, that, her story was my story. Because as you might remember from some of the photographs earlier of me, I was hyper-feminine as a way of, I really wanted to be a lesbian when I grew up and I knew that you had to be a woman to be a lesbian, so I was hiding my intersex characteristics. And he did a similar thing, overdid the femininity to be accepted as a woman. Alex is, did a film called Tin Tin Fish Alarm, from, um, which is a great documentary about his life. Um, Austria, these are my most recent photos. Joe, Holly, Alex. Georgianne. Betsy. Morgan. Sorry, Betsy. Yeah, Betsy. Morgan. Valentino. And my only other intersex ally in Sweden, Ellie. And here is Mara. Mara is the only person so far that has made um, a statement. I am Mara Cabral, I am intersex, I am trans. I am a 40-year-old guy who sometimes dates other guys. I'm living in Cordoba, Argentina. I am an activist and a writer, a secular Jew, and I have a temper, which is true. While all of the above is true, it's also just a way of passing. Passing as someone rather than a something. I am the living incarnation of one of those places where culture has lost its mind and its tongue. I am the embodiment of sexual difference as a suture and a scar. And it was Mara's choice to show the scars. Mara is now married and living in Argentina, married to a man living in Argentina. So that is visibly intersex. Now to finish, I'm going to show some images from my um, my real life as a mapa. This is my now five-year-old child, Mika, Alexis Volcano. <laughs> So how to tell if a toy is for boys or girls? Do you operate the toy with your genitals? No, it's not, it's for, um, no, it's for either girls or boys, but if you do, this toy is not for children. I like that. Um, I, I do a lot of collaborations. Um, one of them was with Maria Lopez, uh, previously known as Girls Who Like Porn. Um, a queer Spanish person who is now a parent of an intersex child. <clears throat> so, 
So 54 years, 3 months, and 22 days ago, um, after I came into the world, Mika Alexis came into mine. I never really scheduled my life in a timely fashion, and I literally do not know how to act my age. Um, nor do I care to learn. So here I am in 2016, a mom for two small children, an apartment who's in the middle of pursuing a doctoral degree. I no longer live in a great, metro metro a great metropolis, metropolis filled with queer possibilities, but live in a small, boring Swedish city. No one there is impressed by Del LeGray's volcano or my work. And all of my fans are under five years old, <laughs> the daycare. Um, strange as it may seem, I'm more satisfied and happy with my life than I've ever been. Um, <clears throat> and one of the reasons I, I, I said that is because for some people, I used to be the queerest of the queer, or so I thought of myself. Um, but once I became a parent, and I became civil partner, um, I've been with my partner for 11 years now, I lost a lot of my queer capital. You know, it's like I was doing those heterosexual things. I probably really wanted to be heterosexual. So, um, this idea of how we ident how we construct our our queer identities is often as in a reactionary way, as a reaction. We have to do whatever heterosexuals do, we don't do, right? Even though we do shit and eat and go to the movies and all those other things. But so I I, I thought about that and you know this photograph has been in mainstream newspapers in Sweden. I'm out about having breastfed, like this is breast milk and a little thing goes in the water. And I breastfed um, Mika in the early days. Well, as much as I could. And this is my partner and I. Um, and I wrote a, an article for a queer magazine, Diva. And I came up with this idea, resistance is fertile. Because you know what? The world needs more good men. And who better to create them than me? So um, this is also, oh, you can't see it here. In Sweden, I don't know if you know, but there is, um, in Swedish, there's three pronouns. Hon, she, han, he, and hen. Jag är hen. I am hen. And I was part of an exhibition by a photographer, Thomas Gunnarsson. Um, it says, them are hen. Who is hen? So I was with a lot of other people, because in Swedish, I am, I prefer the third gender pronoun, hen. And obviously, Mika also usually chooses to be called hen. And this is one of the photographs that Thomas made of us. Which I think is really funny, because I couldn't see Mika's face, but you see how we're both, we have the same expression. <laughs> it's, it's cute. And it's also, even though I was beaten up by a gang of boys in 2004, um, because I, they thought I was a gay man, I stopped wearing my beautiful clothes. Um, and I, when Mika was born, I realized I had to put my beautiful clothes back on. Beautiful clothes, right? Um, so, because you cannot be what you do not see. And my, my partner is way too butch to ever wear makeup in a skirt. On, um, I'm in the hotel over there and I'm watching BBC World News. Today it's come out that, I don't know if you heard this in the news, but they've done studies and they said six-year-old girls are losing their confidence by the time, girls are losing their confidence by the time they're six years old. The binary gender system arms 
us all. We are all influenced by it. And it has devastating consequences. Pink and blue, active, passive, subject, object. Now this is Mika when we, we visited California and Mika was a few weeks old. This is my cousin um, Anaya. This is cousin Anaya. They're born one day apart. And it's interesting that my cousin's children, she also has an older child, True Jackson, and Anaya could not use any of True's clothes because she needed to have pink. This is a person that, you know, my cousin is like 20 something years old, younger than me. And she is still has to streamline her children into girl and boy to the point that even a sippy cup, even a bottle, cannot be blue. Um, this is Jason, who's a trans guy, whose um, child Lori is there. This is when Mika was only 10 weeks old with that. And, um, Yeah, magic Mika. Mika is a child of, you know, at five years and two months old, has not declared a gender. But Mika runs outside naked sometimes. And Mika has long blonde hair down here. The, the longest hair of anyone in this daycare, in fact. And when you ask Mika, so all the kids are saying, I'm doing and Flicka. Are you a boy or a girl in Swedish? Because we're in Sweden. And I say, Mika, what are you saying when all these kids are asking you, are you a girl or a boy? He said, in English, he says, well, mama, I say that I'm both. But I know I'm a boy. But I say I'm both. And I also say, den fro den a froga, are inte so viktig for us. That question, it's not important for us. So, I call him one. And just a few pictures from Odebro and Stockholm. And you know, Sweden is a very tolerant country, so I can go out in my beautiful clothes and not get harassed in a way that is not possible. After getting beaten up in London, I'm not so interested in, in doing that. Um, this is me, I was doing, a, I was using an H&M swimsuit suit that a Brazilian supermodel was wearing, and I was trying to be a supermodel. There, that's my impersonation. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about how homo-nationalism, just for a second, how it functions, because as we know, we are living in a world that is in peril, and I'm um, sorry about what happened in America. I'm, I'm thinking of giving up my American passport now that I have a Swedish one, actually. But people often think that people who come from Middle Eastern backgrounds or African backgrounds are extremely homophobic and transphobic. When my partner, who is a, what I call a, a super handsome, or no, a soft butch, goes to get their hair cut, they're like, oh, but what, are you, what is your husband going to think when, when they ask, can you cut it a bit shorter? Because they're like, but you're such a beautiful woman. Why would you want to make yourself ugly by having short hair? So, getting haircuts, as many of you may know, um, is a kind of unpleasant experience. So Mika was going for their first hair trim, only to split in. Um, and these, th these are the people who own the hair salon. And they were like, are you a girl or a boy? And I said, that's not an important question for us. Mika is at that point four years old and is a child. And they were like, and I said, um, we are hen. We are hen. So they started calling me and Mika hen. That's where my partner now goes to get their hair cut. And um, 
it was no problem that they come from Syria. So I thought that was interesting. How one kind of negotiates. If you, if, does anybody here have children? Can you raise your hand? I just want to. Is it a queer stereotype that people in Greece don't have children? You probably don't get treat. You don't get free fertility treatment. You know? It's probably not legal to be queer and having. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, in in, in Sweden, you get free fertility treatment um, as long as one person has a womb. Gay men are still having a problem. Anyway, grandparents. This is Mika at, the, at um, my partner's mother's house in Germany. And up to a point, it's okay for Mika to be more feminine, because I don't know if I mentioned that Mika does have a penis. Um, but also exhibits like bravery as in cycling down hills and doing things that are, and likes classic cars and stuff. So Mika is, you know, very much, I feel, um, a chip off my block kind of thing, modeling themselves after me in terms of being kind of gender non-binary, gender queer, and not giving a fuck what other people think. When people call Mika, she, it's no problem, he, no problem, hen, no problem, same as me. We just don't care. Don't, don't care what you call us as long as you call us. Ha ha ha. Um, and this is how Mika decides to dress for a fourth birthday party, for going shopping, etc. So, and one little picture of Nico, um, Ilan Tio, that's the other one at home. So, this is. One of my favorite pictures of Mika. Um, Mika often, like me, wants to have draw on a mustache and have lipstick. So now, for the last, the last, what I'm going to leave you with before we have our Q and A, because I told you don't have a very long attention span, because you all need to go and smoke, right? <laughs> so you can smoke in just a minute. Um, or you can stay and we can talk, which I really enjoy. So, Bodies That Queer Remix. Bodies That Queer are bodies we fear. To have and to hold. To watch become old. As we wrinkle and flake, we must not forsake. Bodies that queer are bodies that break. But break though we might, queer bodies are strong. And like everyone else, we want to belong. But belong to what? I hear your brain scream. What kind of queer fits in to a scheme? Bodies that queer are defiantly strange. But that doesn't mean that we're never the same. Queer bodies are bodies that cannot belong to families that hate us or just make us feel wrong. No matter how much we're told to have pride, we must not be reduced or modified. Queer bodies are bodies that refuse to restrain or retrain our pleasures, our histories, our pain. Her bodies are measured. We're prodded and poked. We're cut up and sold as a cultural joke. We're told we're disordered that need to be fixed, that doctors can fix us so we're no longer mixed. Queer bodies disturb, this cannot be denied. Our queerness is sexy 
and unspecified. Body is it queer or a fetish is string? And maybe some of us here are a part of that team. Seems, you know, 100% politically correct. 
Any other thoughts? Yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. First, first of all, thank you so much. That was, I was really, I'm going to be thinking about that for a really long time. Um, thank you. And also, I'm, I'm interested in you deciding to have a family and kind of whether you felt like that was even put off because sometimes in the queer community to do something that seems too normal or conventional almost feels like you're giving up your membership in that yeah. group yeah. and whether now making a decision that might be seen as traditional yeah. makes you feel like you're less part of that community if you've lost friends and realize that even within that community making a something that seems like a conservative move or settling down or having a family is like if that's maybe the next step of queer, like, of making a decision that's not queer as a queer becomes a new queer. Yeah, complicated. Um, complicated subject in question. Um, I don't know about, you're, you're American too, and I, you know, a lot of people get asked, a lot of heterosexual people, um, when are you going to get married and when are you going to have a family? My family never asked me that. In fact, it was assumed I would not have a family, and that was a good thing. I was supposed to keep... Queers are dangerous for kids, right? <clears throat> Especially queers who were producing images about sex. <clears throat> so, it was a big surprise to me. I fell in love with somebody who um, was able, young enough, to have children, and... Um, I think it was it when I and, and I moved to Sweden and in Sweden it was very interesting because my world you know I lived in London 26 years and I lived in a queer bubble when you live in a big city like Athens or London you don't really need to associate with heterosexuals right um, so I didn't for the most part um, and then when I moved to Sweden there were actually straight couples who really wanted me in their kids life. They were like, I was a valuable player. I was bringing, I, and it wasn't just because I was bringing diversity. It was because um, kids love me. I'm really a superstar with kids, I don't know why. Um, but they love me and they, I was valued and that changed me. So I started, I became a member of um, a larger society, and I guess now I'm really invested in not just preaching to the perverted, but converting. I'm into converting. How to make your kids queer? Ask me. And, um, um, so, and yet that even in my very open family of my, I mean, I have a Mormon father, and that's a whole other subject, and brothers. Do you know what Mormons are? right-wing, Republican, patriarchal, the whole thing. But, when I came to Sweden, I was, you're able to, and it's also because of legislation, because you get, you know, free fertility treatment. You, I am, I didn't have to adopt my kids. I am the parent. I, you know, if I had put an ad in the cosmic Craigslist, you know, this is what I have to offer you, kids. And this is what I expect. I tell Mika, I'm carrying you now and wiping my butt, your butt, but you may have to carry me and wipe my butt later. You know, reciprocity. Um, yeah, so it's basically, yes, I did lose friends. I did have people tell me, you know, people have their stereotypes and they need, I do understand it. We've all worked hard to have a queer identity. And up until very recently, that is seen as um, something that does not include marriage and your family. I'm critical of the LGBT, I guess, agenda in the United States that put marriage and the family at the forefront. I'm critical of the idea that anybody needs to have children. I had no idea I would be good at this. And I'm like the best mama in the whole solar system, actually. That's what Mika tells me. Well, he's, Mika says, Mapa, I think you're the only Mapa in the whole soul. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, there's got to be another one somewhere. So if you know, let me know. 
Um, also, I think that, you know, it's, it's a, I can't say one way or the other because, of course, some lesbians and gays are very heteronormative. Of, you know, some people do want to, you know, they do say, I may be in, a woman in love with a woman, but I'm just like everybody else. And so they are. And why do we criticize them when we don't criticize our own brothers and sisters who are straight at the same time? Let them be ordinary. We can be fabulous. <laughs> right? So, regardless of whether or not some lesbians and gays and trans people are heteronormative, I don't care. What I know is that it is possible to raise children without having to indoctrinate them into a damaging gender system. Thank you. You don't have to stay here, you can go smoke, you know. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Have I earned have I earned my money yet, Alex? Have I? My fee? Um, I am gonna be around until Sunday, so if you have Sometimes people come to these things and they actually come out as intersex. So um, if anybody wants to do that and to talk about it, I'm happy. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to, to make a comment about the Trump presidency or the political developments in general. Yeah. Whatever you well, um, yeah, it's been very depressing for me. I didn't believe it. I thought if he ever got this far, surely somebody would assassinate him. And if I didn't have kids, I would, you know, and I was really depressed and thinking about killing myself, I would try. But I'm not depressed and I do have kids, so I won't kill them. But I wish somebody would kill the whole lot of them. Okay. I didn't really, that's just me thinking out loud. It's really fucking scary. And the day, I, I go to um, Swedish for Immigrants, SFE. Um, yeah, I, I, I speak really shit Swedish, so I'm trying to get better. Most of the people in my group are not um, from Western European countries. They're usually from, they're from Syria, they're mo mostly Muslim in the class I was going to. The day after Trump won, this is what I wore to class. And the two oldest Muslim men were like, snake, cute. I got so much support and compliments from these older, older than me even, Muslim men, who are supposed to be so homophobic. And they got it. They said, is this about Trump? I'm like, right. I have to distance myself from your form of hideous masculinity. I mean, oh my God, this is what happens when you raise a raise boy. I mean, I just also want to just, I, I thought about this. So, I mean, really, I'm not a supporter. And I think we're, I really think it's going to be a really rough four years, maybe even more, because I think, I mean, it's, it's the scariest thing that has ever happened in my life. So, yes, but we have to, you know, if you think about it, you all, if you don't have children, I'm sure you have sisters or brothers or cousins, kids in your life, and I know Greek is a very gendered language, but besides that, think about how often we are reinforcing the idea. We never call our children, I do use pronouns in English, he, because I was a lesbian separatist, and I don't want them to grow up thinking, I think there's anything wrong with being a boy. But think about how often you say, what a pretty little girl. What a big, strong boy. And think about how often people 
Even queer people, all people repeat, you're a boy, you're a boy, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're a girl, you're pretty, you're strong. I mean, it's, it's, if we were raised in a different way, we would not be in the mess we are. If men were allowed a greater range of emotions besides anger, you know, what would the world be like? So I feel like this is really, you know, my destiny, too. I didn't know why it would happen. I never planned to have children. I certainly didn't plan to be with um, And yet here I am, about to turn 60, should be a grand, you know, age of grandparent, and I have two young kids, plus all of the kids around them that are in school that know it's possible to be a mapa, that know it's possible to wear beautiful clothes, you know, and have a beard, you know, so, yeah. Any others? One more or two more? Going. Going. Gone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great day, Kate. It was an honor having us with us. And uh, your speech was so motivating. And the images were just breathtaking. And I have to say that you should send our greetings to Mika. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, image to see and everything we saw today. And of course, we have to remind. Uh, to all of you, that upstairs. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot more. Upstairs. Pano, but you're on the pano orofo. Borite na dite dulia peretera por el Andrés Volcano. Ya na que apoyemos más buenos. Eso más y más que eso más buenos. Thank you very much, the Andrés Volcano. Fernando, quiero hablar de una pequeña.